2006, announced the passing of The New York Times of February 16, 2006, announced the passing of Robert W. Peterson, Negro League historian. Bob Peterson was a native of Warren, Pennsylvania, and it was there where he saw some of the great Negro Leaguers in barnstorming games. Bob Peterson was a pioneer, for it was his book, Only the Ball Was White, which recaptured a lost era in baseball history in a rich facet of black life in America, which became the seminal treatise on baseball during the black baseball era. This is how the Venerable Society of American Baseball Research referred to Bob Peterson's book and the launching of an era of understanding of that baseball time period, which included the Josh Gibson's, the Satchel Pages. I'm Joe Black. As a young boy growing up in New Jersey, I would dream of the day when I would play baseball in the major leagues. So it hurt me deeply when at age 17, a baseball scout told me I could not play in the major league because I was colored. You see, in those days, although baseball was thought to be America's number one pastime, it was racially divided. It was for whites only. And it remained that way until 1947 when Jackie Robinson and Larry Doby broke the color line in modern-day Major League Baseball. More than any other sport, baseball has been part of the social fabric of this country. When baseball began to integrate, it marked the beginning of the end for segregation. Baseball dropped its color line long before the Civil Rights Acts of the 1960s. For just as Supreme Court decisions and civil rights marches didn't bring about freedom and real equality for all Americans, Jackie's arrival in Brooklyn didn't mean real justice for minorities in baseball. My first year in the majors was five years after Jackie and Doby had broken the color barrier, and yet I was greeted with name calling and other forms of hatred. Even now, decades later, baseball is still struggling become a game free of prejudice, a game that reflects opportunity and equality for those who choose it as a vocation. There never would have been a Jackie Robinson, a Willie Mays, a Roberto Clemente, a Reggie Jackson, if not for the leagues that black America created on its own during those hateful times. I played in those Negro leagues as a member of the Baltimore Eli Giants. I will always treasure the camaraderie of those years and the challenge of playing against Josh, Cool, and Buck. In 1988, Baseball Commissioner Bart Giamatti said, we must never lose sight of our history insofar it is ugly, never to repeat it, and insofar it is glorious, to cherish it. What you are about to see is a part of that history in all its ugliness and all its glory. One fine morning, I'm going to reach up and grab me a handful of stars, swing out my long, lean leg, and whip three hot strikes burning down the heavens. And look over at God and say, how about that? During the half century that baseball was divided by a color line, Black America created its own major leagues. From the 1920s through the 1940s, these Negro leagues flourished. Teams like the Homestead Grays, the Pittsburgh Crawfords, and the Newark Eagles barnstormed their way across the country. I loved them, the game. I played it with all my heart. I played it with, what do they call it, reckless abandon. I ran over hills, run into fences, dove in pig pens. I'll never forget that. I drove in the, oh, I can smell it now. Mother always knew where her baby boy was. All during the day, even in the morning, I was down in that ball field because I was baseball nuts.
In the 1890s, black ball players were driven out of the major leagues by racial reaction. Many of the games won during Reconstruction were reversed. But beyond the boundary drawn by segregation, black America built a baseball world of its own. Vince McNamara, his name is synonymous with the Pony League and now the New York Penn League. He was an umpire in the formative years and he became president in 1949 and was its leader for over 37 years. Though raised in Buffalo, Vince played on the Jamestown Billy Webb Spiders in the 1930s. He was their star shortstop. Vince gives us some clues regarding the question of Celron and black baseball. May I remain sitting? Yes, please, do. Uh, I've got to confess to you people that I've been negligent about reading a book that was given to me about five years ago. And knowing I was coming down here to be with you today, and I talked with Mike Maloney, I said, what the hell do they want me to talk about, Mike? He said, I don't know. So I started putting some things together. And I went and got this book off the rack. I don't know who gave this to me. Only the ball was white, written by a guy named Peterson. Joe Overfield knows him very well. In fact, Joe has a picture, he has a picture in here that Joe Overfield gave him in this book. And I told Joe about it. This guy's one hell of a writer. And the thing that struck me so forcefully about this guy just coming through this book. They talk about Sauron was a village on Chautauqua Lake about three miles west of Jamestown in southwestern New York, whose sole claim to attention was a big amusement park. I remember that very well. Uh, on the decoration day, we would go out there, put on our uniforms and pray from Sauron Park over to the ballpark, which was just around the corner. And uh, we would not get paid for that, uh, that day down there. We'd take that money and Billy Webb would invest it in rain insurance. So we never got raised that down there. I remember that. But the village was there to talk with assembly, a collection of summer schools offering education and entertainment. To talk ones who worried of the cultural life could go down the lake by steamboat and enjoy the more plebeian amusement itself, including the Acme Giants. That was the team that played here for Jake so, And here it is here. Shalaran Bombay, that's what they call it. You got murdered the first day of that. Bradford was in that league too, but this goes way the heck back. And it, I was so sort of proud to have been a part, having been associated with so many of these fine ball players. Uh, all the satchel page every time I looked up, he was at Sullivan Park throwing fast balls at me. It's that interview with Vince McNamara was sort of our first introduction to that book, and now I'm so thrilled to introduce the author of that book, Only the Ball Was White, Bob Peterson. And Bob, we're just going to free flow. And what what got you inspired to even do a book like that? That not your background, is it? Well, you, as you can see, I was getting a little long in the tooth. I was a boy in the '30s in Warren, and baseball at that time was everywhere. We had a, in Warren, we had a team called or a league called the Sunset League, where adult men, these are not kids, would work the day if they had a job. They'd work their day job. They come out at six o'clock and play baseball three or four nights a week. That's how popular the game was in those days. We also had the better, the best players in town. Then on Sundays and well Saturdays would play teams from other towns. Semi pros that get. I I did it. And I think I made ten bucks a game. That was about the scale after World War II. Uh, so I, I played. I saw all the. Not all. I saw a lot of the barnstorming black teams. The Homestead Grays came into Warren at least every other year. The, the Philadelphia Stars, the Baltimore Eli Giants, came in quite regularly. They'd play either the local semi-pros or they'd have an exhibition game between two black teams uh, in Warren, which had no black people in there. Black teams barnstormed their way across the country, living on buses, playing two or three games a day. Baseball was something that I could do. 
and I loved it. I enjoyed all the years that I played. And I had a lot of fun. <laughs> but it was a little work in it too. Because we were not playing night baseball, going around the lead after this ball game, going to another town to play the next ball the next night, and going to the next to play another different town every day. Playing in a different town every day. The traveling was tough. I don't think you can hardly name a, a small town or coal mining town uh, that I didn't play in. We even made baseball diamonds. Went to uh, little towns and made baseball diamonds, and the fence was the cause. The cause uh, just got all the way around us, way out in the outfield out there, and made a fence, and we would pass the hat around. Which I'm still doing. Uh, and I decided soon after I became a freelance in 66 that I'd like to do a book. And I thought back to the, those days of the, of the Negro baseball leagues and decided that that had never been covered and therefore I was going to cover it. I like to do things that nobody else has done. So that's how I got started on the project. Does that answer your question? Wonderfully. Okay. What was, what was the surprise that you found? Did you have a particular thesis in mind that you knew you would, that you were hoping to find and perhaps you didn't uh, when you started the research? Not really. I think though, I. The farther I got into it, I, I, I started it just because I enjoyed baseball and it was a, fa a facet of baseball that had never been covered. Mm -hmm. That's how I got into it. But the more I got into it, the more I be began to believe that Negro baseball was a, an important historical artifact, not just of black history, but of American history. It, was, it reflected the times, the segregated times that, that, during which it lived, the 30, 20s, 30s, 40s. Uh, was a segregated era, and uh, while I don't know that Jamestown was terribly much affected, Warren certainly was not. We rarely saw black people unless a black baseball team came in. So the more I got into it, the deeper I got into it, the more I thought it was significant beyond sports, that it was, it was an important part of black identity in this country. Next to the black church, I think black baseball was probably the most solid institution there was in, in black communities. Now you really started off to uh, research black baseball during its segregation period. Oh yes. Uh, yet you had to do research prior to that to sort of put it in a framework. You were one of the first really to unearth a lot of uh, the fact that there was integrated baseball more than most people probably thought uh, post or pre-1900, uh, including Sarah. Oh yeah. Well, I, that, that was known, though. It was known, it, it, some of the baseball encyclopedias had Moses uh, Fleetwood Walker and his brother Weldy as the first black players. And a few of them mentioned Frank Grant, who played up in Buffalo, mm -hmm. a, as well as for some black teams. So it was known, but there wasn't much about them. It was just a mention that they had played in 1880, what was it, 4? 84, I guess. I can't, I can't remember. 1884, they played in what was then a major league. It was called the American Association, but it was it challenged the National League for supremacy and was recognized as a as a as a big league. Did you, in your research, what little I've read about it is Cap Anson during that time period was mm -hmm. really the guy that put the blocks to having the blacks more involved in the major league. <coughs> really rationale behind that. I, do, I don't know that it's true. It's all, the, the story is based on a book uh, called The History of Colored Baseball by Saul White, which was published in 1907. And he was the guy who blamed Cap Anson for banning black players from, from uh, the big leagues. But I don't find any evidence of it. It's, it doesn't say that he did anything in his autobiography. He, he didn't like blacks. He, he had contempt for them. I could tell, I'll tell that by reading his autobiography because he had a, on a worldwide tour he made with a team of big leaguers, he had a mascot, a little black kid, a, a mascot, and he used very contemptuous terms to describe him. But I don't, I never saw any evidence in the papers that Anson had done anything overt at least to get black players out. Ken Burns sort of unfortunately carried on that. Uh, well. That, 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 it's 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 the common scuttlebutt. I just don't happen to believe it. That's all. <laughs>
How did you discover on the fact that, at least locally here, to me, I find as a, uh, I think you used the term significant footnote in baseball history, is Celeron. Mm -hmm. And the, the fact that the Jamestown area was significantly more tolerant than other communities in uh, not only allowing black baseball, but even not even mentioning it in the newspaper. Uh, in the first place, I live near New York City, which has the, one of the three great research libraries of the world. Yeah. And among other things, they have a complete file of Sporting Life, which is a weekly paper that started published in 1884 and continued into to the early 1900s. And they were the ones that I picked up a lot of this little stuff about, for example, Celeron. That was in Sporting Life. Well, I had a free hotel down in Warren. My mother and sister lived down there. <laughs> so whenever I'd come and visit them, I'd come up to Buffalo or Jamestown and do some research. And the, the, the fact that Jamestown appeared to be very accepting was clear to me from the standpoint that they never mentioned that, uh, quick, his name. Kelly. Kelly was black. He, he, he was in the box scores. I'd never even seen you had a picture of the team later on I never saw that when I was researching but uh, he wasn't he was never mentioned as a black man in the uh, Jamestown paper that I ever saw. He, he was mentioned as black in sporting life which is how I knew that he was here and that and that he played for uh, uh, the Jamestown team the Giants the Celeron Acme Giants in sporting life and subsequently did a little research in was it the evening journal at the time whatever the paper was at the time anyway but that is a, for our purposes and a little known fact that only you really brought the light and, mm -hmm. uh, we've had some fun trying to dig up all the old box scores and, and i think i sent them down to you fellows may not know this but greg wrote a piece for one of the saber Pub the society for american baseball research <coughs> publications about the cell run Acme Giants. It's probably the most complete story about that team there is. Sidelight, having never written something for publication, when I sort of started off, sort of a free flow, sit down, talk into a microphone, had one of the girls in my office pipe it up, uh, and then I'd send it to just more for internal information. And he said, well, this is the kind of thing that ought to be published. And, and Greg, why don't you work on it? And you ought to, and here are people to send it to. I'll, I'll tell you. When I got it back, I said, I don't know how to do this. So Bob, I sent it back to Bob, thanks so much for the encouragement. Uh, however, I don't know how to do this. So I sent it back, and what you read, what you read, and if you read the article of Society of American Baseball Research, and what I started off with, uh, not quite the same. And so thanks to Bob Peterson. Well, that isn't really true, but thank you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Wins, Bob go into the turn of the century and uh, now we're into that segregationist mode where in fact professional baseball as we know it just wasn't uh, accepting tell us a little bit what what were the was it economics that generated the creation of separate leagues or was it just it was the trend of the country when uh, in 1896 the Supreme Court gave a decision called Plessy versus Fort Ferguson, which gave states the right to um, to segregate black people uh, in in accommodations in hotels and railroads. I, the case was actually about a railroad uh, a guy putting a guy out of a white car in a railroad, but it was applied then to schools and hotels and parks and swimming pools, everything. That was continuing throughout the early part of the century and it was really it was blatant is the wrong word it was uh, uh, absolutely uh, intolerable the lengths to which it went particularly in the south but in the north to a certain extent I know my wife grew up in Meadville and said that black people in Meadville when she was young could not sit in the main body of the theater they had to go upstairs in the balcony now this is in Meadville PA on the other hand, during her tenure in high school, a black kid was president of the student body. So how do you how do you balance those two facts? I have no idea, but 
the, the problem was that in the teens, 20s, and 30s, segregation was uh, absolute in the South and severe, I would say, in the North, although they were never uh, uh, prohibited from attending school with whites, except, I think, in Indiana. There they were segregated. Do they call it Negro, base, Negro League Baseball? Was that a pejorative term at the time? Or was no, it not at all. The, the term actually has, that term has developed over the years. A lot of the old players I interviewed referred to themselves as colored, which was the original the 20s, the teens and 20s. In fact, one of the ne first Negro Leagues was called the Eastern Colored League. Negro then was the acceptable term from, I would say, um, probably 1930 to the early 60s, when that was deemed slightly derogatory and they then wanted black. Now it's African American. I have trouble keeping up with the <laughs> changes myself. But I try to repair my book every once in a while and make it politically correct. Have you ever thought of doing a, an update on your book? Yeah, sure, lots of times, but I, nobody was interested at the time I was wanted to do it. Uh, not so much an update, but after the book was published, I proposed a book on, uh, are you familiar with uh, Baseball's Great Experiment by Jules Tigell? Well, it follows after my book. It covers the early years of integration in the big leagues and in the minor leagues. Excellent job. And I, I offered to do that book, and uh, nobody was interested in that time. Now, it was done about 15 years ago, and it's, uh, I think it's probably the best-selling baseball book, except for Larry Ritter's The Glory of Their Times. But uh, I tried other things, a biography of Josh Gibson didn't go anywhere, uh, a kid's book of black baseball didn't go anywhere. This was in the early 70s. It was in the middle 80s that the the subject exploded, and now there probably are 50 books on the subject, at least. The Society of American Baseball Research has its own committee on that, and uh, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, you're, you're speaking on Do you find that there's a renaissance in Bob Peterson? Well, there was right before the Robinson 50th anniversary in uh, last year, but I'm pretty passe now, really. <laughs> Not to us. No, well... That's because you're behind the times. <laughs> <laughs> of the characters that were part of your book, of course, the Josh Gibson, the Satchel Pages, uh, many of them Barnstorm, obviously through, through our area as well. Were there a couple of those that just kind of jumped out and said, these guys are a little bigger than life? Oh, Page, obviously. Yeah. I don't know, Gibson didn't have the color, the uh, color, i put that in quotes. <laughs> he didn't, he wasn't colorful in the sense that Page was. And so I don't think he was ever appreciated as, nearly as much as Page was. About the Negro Leagues, you want to remember that you, first you saw skilled baseball way ahead of their time, of fellas who should have been in the major leagues. You saw that. You have to recall some of those plays that were made. You had to see that ball hit by Josh Gibson over Greenleaf Fall and the ball falling down on the boulevard, probably striking somebody's car. You had to see Satchel Page say to a, but I'm going to strike you out, boy, and strike him out. Satchel Page was overpowering fast, and when I first saw him, he had no fast, no uh, curveball. He just had a fastball, in and out, up and down. And uh, you knew that you were going to get a fastball, but you had to guess where. Satchel was really something. Now, I can see him with them big feet. Man, he had about a 16. And he'd plant that big foot out there, and he'd kick like that. And the dust would fly, and the ball would hit the kitchen. <laughs> the same I think he distracted the hitters and threw them off balance with that movement he had. He didn't need no windup. He didn't use no windup. He could, he could flail that ball. I'll tell you one thing about Satchel Page. Now, he was a great one. Uh, he could, he, he even one time I was up there watching him, he told all the fellas outfield, come on in, stand by me and, uh, and I'm striking these three out. And he did it too. Struck all three of them out. Oh, we had men about a, 
We had men by the hundreds could have made the big league for that concern. By the hundreds, not by the four twos or threes. By the hundreds, could, they had more. They had a lot of such a pages out there. Men could throw the ball hard as me. If Satchel Paige was Black Baseball's premier pitcher, Josh Gibson was its most powerful hitter. Their exploits against white major leaguers in postseason play were carried by the black press and by word of mouth throughout the land. Gibson was very impressive. Josh, most imposing man I've ever seen as a hitter. He uh, was very strong, broad shoulders, happy-go-lucky, uh, confident, knew he was good, but he didn't flaunt it. He just got out and did what he was supposed to do. Could run like a deer, had a rifle for an arm, and, uh, you know, and could, uh, and could really hit. Now, that Josh Gibson, I guess, had he lived, he, he certainly would be a millionaire today. And, uh, he was, uh, the type of person that just liked everybody and always a smile like a big old grown kid. If I'd step on the bus, he'd say, why, oh my, it's Miss Posey. And he'd run and he'd almost pick me up and put me in the bus and everything and see that I had this and say, and the first thing he'd say is to the boys is, and that was it. And they knew better than to say one ugly word or anything in front of me, you know. Josh was the most awesome hitter I've ever seen. He was like the black Babe Ruth. I wish that he and the Babe uh, uh, had a chance to meet each other. I don't think they ever did. Josh would uh, uh, used to kid about the Babe a lot. For instance, sometimes uh, uh, he said, well, let's, uh, let me look in the paper and see what the king of SWAT did today. He said, uh, I thought the people in Pittsburgh said I was the king uh, of SWAT. And he'd say, well, I see the babe hit two today. Maybe I better go out and hit three to prove that I'm, I'm the king of the Particularly guys with colorful nicknames like Cool Papa Bell. How do you beat that? <laughs> or Bullet Rogan. Those are great names, uh, and, and I think they reflected their their uh, personalities to a certain extent. So how about the ownership in those days? Was it, uh, was it a black ownership? Was it a subtle white ownership? Or... Uh, it was almost exclusively black except for the Kansas City Monarchs. They were owned by a white fellow named uh, J.R. Wilkinson. In fact, he started them. Uh, he started them back in the early 20s and owned them right up to their, well, I guess he gave it to his son-in-law eventually, but but uh, he owned them through their glory years, and they were probably one of the two or three best teams in the league. The others tended to be all black ownership. A lot of numbers guys were in it, uh, which I didn't know. I knew a couple of them were, but a fellow who did a book subsequent to mine called um, Invisible Men discovered that uh, an awful lot of the owners in, in uh, the Negro League teams were numbers guys. They were the guys who had the money in the black community, and they could drop a few thousand dollars if necessary to have their name in the papers. So the, that was true of the Pittsburgh Crawfords. They were numbers owners. New York Black Yankees were owned by numbers guys. They were, uh, that was their business. When it came to the barnstorming days before really the, well, put me into perspective. When was it that they start to organize black leagues? 1920 was the first successful one. There had been some experience experiments before that, but that was the first successful one. It was the Negro National League. It was started in Chicago with about eight Midwestern teams. Mm -hmm. and then, then prior to that time, there was just basically barnstorming teams? Oh, yes. Yeah. There, there was a league in 1910, but it didn't thrive. There was a league in the South even earlier than that, but it didn't thrive either. Uh, it, it, they were mainly barnstormers. They played college teams and, uh, and semi-pros. Mm -hmm. And pros. In those days, uh, it wasn't a disgrace to play a black team. So that some of the major league teams played them in the 1800s and in the uh, early 1900s. What were the economics of all that, the barnstorming team? Were they that good that they would be that much of a draw in a community? I mean, is that, or they, the fact that they were black? 
Well, I don't know that the blackness had too much to do with it, but I think base, there was, baseball was a big sport in those days, much bigger, I think, than it is today. Despite the money that's in it, I don't think it's as popular today as pro football, for example, or maybe even at certain times of the year, basketball, which I think is a pity because I personally think it's a much better game. However, um, in those days, it was the sport. And as I said earlier, a town like Warren would have three or four little town, a little um, Sunset League teams and one or two teams of pretty good players, uh, pretty decent semi-pros, guys who could have played in, the, in, uh, in organized baseball probably, but could make more money for their families working in National Forge or Struthers Wells or someplace like that. So they never tried uh, uh, organized leagues. Then comes the National League, which is the first really organized and successfully organized black. And then there was, there was an American League? Was well, the first, in uh, two years later, the uh, Eastern Colored League was organized. It was New York and Philadelphia and Brooklyn, and there was a team in Boston, and Harrisburg had a team, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, and they thrived pretty well. They didn't depend so much on games against black teams, though, as they did in the Midwest. They did more barnstorming because there were a lot more white teams in these areas around the big city, you know. Right where I live now, there were three or four high-quality uh, semi-pro teams in, the, in these years in the 30s and 40s. Guys that were old major leaguers or on the way up or uh, quality players in any event. Patterson Silk Sox, for example, near where I live, they were great. Well, these teams have played them more in Jamestown Barnstorming. Did they overnight in this area? No, they didn't. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what the practice was with the black baseball teams. I do know. I did a, a book on on the early days of pro basketball. It was published about ten years ago, eight years ago, and I interviewed a fellow who ran a pro team in Warren. It's called the Warren Pins. They were in the National Basketball League at the time. And he told me that when black teams came into Warren, they came up to Jamestown to stay after the game. They, apparently the hotels in Warren would not accept them. So they came to Jamestown. I remember once, I don't know why I remember it, but a, a team, uh, the Homestead Grays played in Warren at, at twilight. We had no lights in Warren. Played a game in twilight, and then they had to get in their cars and go to Olean and play a night game. Olean is a big city and it had lights. So, so uh, I imagine then they stayed in Olean. I don't think they would have turned around and gone back to Pittsburgh at the middle of the night, but I don't know. They did some weird things to make a living in those days, so maybe they did. And we had a semi-pro basketball team who played in a tournament in Brookville. And outside of Brookville, we sat for two hours in the restaurant trying to get waited on because we had one. You had one black guy. One black boy, he wanted to leave. He said, we'll sit here by God with the Did they finally serve you? They finally with no, he was not disruptive of anybody. We just sat and laughed. We shared our beers and they found it. Well, I was in the late 60s. Gee, that's surprising that that would be the case in Brookville then. Yeah, really? We were outside. Hmm. The last paragraph of the preface of your book, quote, one summer day in 1939, a kid squatted on the bank behind home plate at Russell Field in Warren, Pennsylvania, fielding foul balls, which could be redeemed for a nickel each, no small consideration those days, that saw Jock Gibson hit the longest home run ever struck in Warren County. It was one of the most impressive feats performed by touring black players that excited the wonder and admiration of that foul ball shaker. This book is the belated proof of his wonder. Signed Robert Peterson. Tell us about that. <laughs> Remember that <it> was, <laughs> Warren had a, it, in those days, Tom wouldn't even know it, but the field was where Sylvania is now, down over a bank, and uh, there was a football field there for the high school, and then there was, the home plate was near the bottom of the hill, and they put up, they would put up a canvas fence around the outfield to uh, make a fence, and uh, all I can recall is that, um, that uh, Gibson hit the longest one I ever saw. And I, I, I said, I, without, without any uh, attempt at checking anything, 
I said it was the longest one ever hit in Warren County. Who's gonna, who's gonna I don't know. <laughs> nobody, so far, nobody has attacked me. On <laughs> now, did your family also have this keen interest that you have? No, no, not really. My wife is not athletic at all, and she doesn't care. My kids do, but they were only children when this was done. I See, this book was published in 1970. My son was then 11, and my daughter was nine or something like that. So they had no interest in Negro baseball. Did you have, to have a hard time selling the subject? I mean, this is, this Not is much. No, I didn't. Uh, I, I was rejected by A.S. Barnes, which at that time published some baseball stuff. I know they had an encyclopedia out, but my second choice was Prentice Hall, and at that time they had a big trade department, trade book department, and they accepted it. And uh, I never thought they promoted it very well, and they dropped it. It went out of print after six years, maybe sold maybe 7,000 copies, and went out of print, and they didn't want to put it into paperback. So it languished for the next eight years, and was finally published in paperback in 84 by McGraw-Hill, and then that went out of print about three years later, and, and it, since 1990, it's been in Oxford University Press paperback. Oh, and it's also, I want you to know, I'm with the Harvard Classics. There is a leather-bound edition. <laughs> the Congratulations. Easton Press, which is a little outfit in, in Connecticut that publishes leather-bound books, decided to do uh, a baseball series, so they did, uh, oh, Summer of 49 and Glory of Their Times and uh, a Yogi Berra biography and I don't know what all, about 20 of them, including me. So I'm in, I'm in leather covers. Mm -hmm. Do you, are you asked to, um, today, I mean, I know you're going to give that speech at Sabre, are you asked today to give speeches? Or are you, you well, I gave, every year now in Atlantic City, they have a, a day set aside to honor Pop Lloyd, John Henry Lloyd. He, this, a stadium was named for him a long time ago, and it, 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 fall in, it fell into decrepitude a few years ago, and a committee was formed to save it, and uh, I think with the help of casino uh, interests, they were able to refurbish this stadium. And every year they have a program honoring it, uh, honoring John Henry Lloyd and giving awards to school kids and things like that. And I gave a lecture last October on that series. They've had other people much better known than me, but uh, I did that. I don't give speeches very often because I'm not a good speech maker. So. Terrific. <laughs> what kind of money were these guys making? Uh, most of the during most of the period. Well, in the early days, in the 1880s and so, uh, pitchers made $15 a week, outfielders made $12 a week on these black teams. By the 20s, $300 a month was a big, big salary, and I would guess the average was probably more like 150 for playing ball virtually every day and twice on Sunday. Uh, in the 40s, the money that was really the money period when the war was on and the people in the home front were making money working in the war industries, the, uh, a fellow like Buck Leonard would make 1000 bucks a month, which was pretty good money. And I've heard, I don't, I couldn't confirm this with Gibson's sister, but I've heard that Josh Gibson made 1200 a month. And those player, players of that quality could also go to the Caribbean in the winter and play all winter and make another four or 5,000 bucks. So they were among the economic elite in the black community because a laboring man in those days, in, in the 30s, was making, um, 20 bucks, 25 bucks a week. And these guys were doing uh, four times that. So they were among the elite in the black community. Were their pitching rotations the same every four or five days, or were they pushing these guys? Well, Buck Leonard told me that, um, that uh, they'd have three or four pretty good pitchers, and then they'd have four or five they called Sakama Yaks, <laughs> who pitched against the white semi-pro teams that were weak teams. And so that their good pitchers would be saved for the weekends, and when they played their games against black teams. And during the week when they were barnstorming against semi-pros, they'd pitch their Sakama yachts. And I guess that was pretty general in black baseball. But they didn't carry very big squads. I, 16 was a 
large, large uh, roster, so that pitchers wound up playing the outfield a lot mm -hmm. too. Well, do you think their museum were ever pulled into Cooperstown or will it stand by itself? I don't know. They have rather ambitious plans. Uh, I know one of the guys who was involved in starting it, and they sound serious, but I don't know. But, uh, Cooperstown does have some stuff, you know. Uh, not so much, they have my research materials for one thing. I sent them out there in 1972, and so any researcher who wants to look at the field can look at my stuff. Although, interestingly, I think my tapes are dying. I gather that audio tapes don't last very long. Does anybody know about that? Okay. That they well, deteriorate, right? Uh, Sell your product here. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you'll, they're not going to last forever. So you want to retape them at some point if you can. Okay, well. Because the better care you give them, the better lo the longer they'll last. Well, do you do you? What's good care though? To run them every once in a to while. To exercise them at least once a year. Go back and forth oh, at least okay. once a year. Uh, keep them out of the heat. Keep them out of the humidity. Keep them in a cool area. Okay. Well, I suspect mine are pretty well gone Send now. Send them they're, to me. I'll tell. They're help thirty you years old. Yeah. <laughs> do you still have those boxes? No, they're at Cooperstown. What it tells, what it tells. But they are the, they're practically impossible to play now. They're reel to reel. Do you ever see a reel to reel player? The reels are about like yay, and they go. The thing, the box weighs about 20 pounds. Uh, so I don't know whether they're retaping them onto audio cassettes or not. I suppose they'll be passe in a few years, right? And they have some other technology. Well, I sure hope not. But you know, <laughs> hopefully we'll be around to tell about it. Well, tell, 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 just take a deep breath here. Tell, tell them what Loringer's contemplating doing related to oh, the I, line of, of oral history. In many senses, what this group's been doing for the last four years has been uh, inviting various ball players, including Tom, and, and, and many of the old ball players, uh, the Falcons, et cetera, to come and tell their story and frankly capture some form or fashion, either audio, most importantly, video, uh, to preserve it. Did you have that sense when you were interviewing these folks for the book that it was perhaps you had something more than just notes or how aids for your book, something like you're preserving a history that will otherwise just sort of pass away? Not really. I don't think I was ever that uh, conscious of, of contributing to history, although in fact as I got into it farther I suppose I did realize that I had useful stuff and the uh, Hall of Fame of course was glad to take it off my hands. My problem in interviewing was that it was hard to find the players, believe it or not. I could go out before breakfast tomorrow morning and find uh, 150 surviving Negro League players by uh, lunchtime. Uh, in those days, that wasn't the case. They, they had lost touch with each other. And I'd find one, and he'd lead me to another, and then he'd lead me to another. It took me the better part of two and a half years to find, I think it was 12 players. And now I did find some that I couldn't afford to go interview. Uh, one of my problems was I didn't have a big advance, and, <laughs> and I, I had to be careful about uh, spending money. I was raising a family at the time. But uh, uh, I, I went first to Roy Campanella because I knew he had a liquor store in Harlem. And he wasn't very helpful, but he did tell me that Buck Leonard was down in Rocky Mount, and he told me that Judy Johnson was a scout for the Phillies. So I had a starting point there. So I went to them and interviewed them, and uh, uh, Leonard told me where Cool Papa Bill was, and, and uh, Johnson had an address for Bill Yancey, and that was the way I operated. I did find a, a club in Chicago called the Old Ball Players Club of Chicago that put me on to about six or seven old players and a couple of widows in Chicago. So I was able to make a trip out there. I didn't make trips for one interview. Yeah. I, I had to have five or six to make it worthwhile. <laughs> Speaking of that, you'll be interested in this, I think. If you ever looked at that book really critically, you will think, gee, that ends rather suddenly. As soon as, uh, as, soon as I've got Jackie Robinson playing in the majors, I use about two pages to kiss it off the rest of the, the, rest of the years. And the reason was I needed the last 750 bucks of the advance which I couldn't get until I finished the book to pay my bills. <laughs> so that's why it ends rather suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
were they reluctant interviews? Not in the slightest. I had nothing but but interest in my project and nothing but courtesy in receiving me and compliments when they got the book. Oh, it was wonderful. These men were strangely not at all bitter. They, even though they had been rejected from the top of their profession uh, for a period of 50 years, they didn't have, they were disappointed. Some of them were disappointed, but they were not, they didn't say, oh, you're a white man, you go and stuff it. They, they were very courteous and very uh, nice to me. You interviewed the players and some of the widows. Did you also interview some of the owners? Was uh, Posey around at that time? No, Posey died in 46 or thereabouts. Uh, I don't know that any of the owners were still alive other than Alec Pompez, who owned the New York Cubans. Uh, he was still alive because I met him the year after the book was uh, published when Satchel Page was announced for the Hall of Fame. He had been on the selection committee, but I didn't even know where he was when I was working on the book. So. Did you interview Satchel? I, I, believe it or not, I just told you I never went one any place to do one interview. I went to Kansas City from Chicago when I visited Chicago. I went to Kansas City expressly to visit Page. I arranged in advance for it. I go up and I knock on the door. His daughter says, oh, he's not here. He won't be here for a couple of days. Uh, Page was notoriously uh, um, indifferent to schedules and uh, not very considerate. So I spent, I don't know, a couple hundred dollars going to Kansas City for nothing. It was the most disappointing part of my business. I did meet him later on when he was inducted uh, in the Hall of Fame. Would you find it, now that you read the book today, maybe you don't even read it now, but would you find that you say, gee, I missed that, or I wish I'd added that at the time? Well, yeah, sure. I, it could, the book could have been much better than it is. But I think given my limitations of time and money, it's a fairly decent book. Mm -hmm. uh, the most egregious error in the book is the spelling of Celeron. I'm sure you've noticed that. Notice that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know but how you're, it... But you're, you're not alone. <laughs> is, uh, could, could the Evening Journal have spelled it wrong back in the 80s? Actually, well, I, I don't <laughs> remember. I'm not usually that <laughs> careless. <laughs> Oh, is that so? They did last night, isn't it? Really? Really sure. I'm going to check this here and see if How about fans? Did you get to the level of, of one of the things we did in our interviewing, we grabbed actually a couple of folks who uh, sat down in our ballpark for 50 years and interviewed them as sort of giving us a, uh, a continuum of interest. Is that part of your book at all? No, not really, not really. I do mention the fact that that uh, that there were whites at at most of the black games, including the ones uh, in the major cities. But they were fairly much in the minority. Yes. I remember so well when I met Larry Ritter, who uh, who wrote uh, the Glory of Their Times. He had grown up in New York City, and he was not aware. He went to the Yankee Stadium all the time. And he wasn't aware that black teams played in Yankee Stadium. Now that strikes me as strange, but I guess the, the papers never covered them, except for the All-Star game. And uh, so I guess they weren't considered to be worth bothering with by the white press. Do you get a sense that Pittsburgh, with, with the Homestead Grays and with the Crawfords, was sort of really the, the hot spot of black baseball? Is that just because of their success that we perceive that? Oh, there was definitely a hot spot. I don't know that it was quite as big as Kansas City, though. Kansas City, the uh, Monarchs were kings of the hill as far as uh, as far as the black community in Kansas City went. They had booster clubs and uh, regular um, regular meetings uh, devoted to the team and honors all over the place. But it was big in Pittsburgh too. And in Newark, Newark, New Jersey, which had the Eagles right after the war and a very good team, uh, two Hall of Famers, three Hall of Famers on it. Willie Wells, uh, Monty Irvin, and um, Roy Dandridge all played for that team.
So it was big there too in the black community. Are you asked at all as to who in the Negro Leagues has been overlooked? Oh yeah, all the time. Really? Yeah, I would. I have no. Opinion. I'll ask you. <laughs> I have only one man that I think should have been one of the first three, Smokey Joe Williams. He was a pitcher from the teens and the twenties and the thirties, pitched for something like twenty-eight years, and I think he should have been one of the top three. But otherwise, I don't know. There are guys in Saber that think there ought to be a hundred of them, and I think that's kind of absurd. But I don't tell them that. <laughs> Are the records of the black teams of stats really as accurate as the other? No, not not even close. Not even close. Some of the Saber members have made a very valiant effort to get statistics to support their argument that this player or that player was outstanding, but I, it's not convincing because so many games are missing. The point is that the black press covered Negro baseball, but it was a weekly operation in those days. There, were, there weren't any dailies until the 50s. And, and they didn't cover it in person. They asked the managers or the, somebody on the team to send them the box scores. And they would run what they could. But not much of it, is, it appears in the, in the black press. So that there's no way, really, to get accurate statistics. They've done a pretty good job, but uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't testify to the accuracy of any of it. Now, how about film and news Is there much of that? Very little. A, a catcher by the name of Quincy Troop, who played in the, I guess he must have started in the late 30s through the 40s. He, his son, by the way, is a well-known poet named Quincy Troop. Anyway, uh, he did some filming uh, with a home handheld camera, and that was used on um, documentary called There's Always Sun Shining Someplace. Did you ever see that one? It's similar to Only the Ball Was White. It was done by a fellow up in Connecticut and he interviewed some old timers and got this film and shows some of it. It's pictures out the bus window as they're driving through the countryside and on the field shots. Very grainy and very black and white of course. But it's all there is so make do. Somebody in Pittsburgh did one uh, not last three or four years. Uh, someone on the Grays, and they grabbed, they may have grabbed some of it. Uh, uh, Ken Burns had a little bit of it, had a little bit of color. In fact. Uh, the later All Star games in Pittsburgh may have been covered a little bit of color. Oh, I don't know about that. Do you think so? The, the All-Star Games ended around 55, I think. Was the color being used then yeah. in sports? Maybe so. I didn't see oh, what Jack, happened to Jackie Robinson. I think, by and large, they were very supportive. That Almost universally, of course, Gibson was died by the time John Robinson got to the majors. But uh, they, were, they were supportive, but they really didn't think much of Robinson as a ball player, believe it or not. They, he, they said he was not the best player in the Negro Leagues by far. In fact, most of them thought Monty Irvin was better, uh, as well as some others. But uh, they all were very supportive of him, and they all, of course, laud him now highly for the abuse he took and how he stood up to it and what he went through to, to um, achieve what he did. Do you agree uh, is, in your research that, that of that analysis, Jackie is probably having the right kind of temperament to take on that initial abuse? Oh, there's no question, I think. He was, I think he was obviously the ideal candidate. I couldn't have done it, and I don't think there are very many black guys who could have done it, taken that abuse without lashing out. And of course, when he was a, when he was set free, I think it was in '48, he was one of the SOBs in the league in terms of uh, uh, taunting and abusing and being generally obnoxious. He, in person, though, he's a very nice fellow. When he got off the baseball field. But what kind of a scouting system did they have? I mean, did they have any kind of a minor league system for the black people? Well, there was a league called the, the uh, Southern Negro League that was ostensibly a minor league, but in fact it didn't it didn't achieve much that way. They, they picked up their players by word of mouth primarily. They'd hear about they barnstorm through some town and some kid would uh, hit a, a long ball and they'd offer him a chance to stick with the team for a while and stay and if he can make it he's made it.
But there wasn't any organized scouting in that in those terms. No. They didn't have the money for those frills. <coughs> talk to Jackie Robinson. Was he a pretty bitter guy at that point? Was Not at all. Know? But of course, he had been the hero of the of the black community for, I talked to him in, must have been 68, the winter of 68, or just a year or two, a couple years before he died. And uh, he wasn't bitter, but he had no reason to be bitter other than the fact that he was black and black people still were not treated equally, even in those days. But my goodness, he had had more honors and more uh, more praise than any black since Booker T. Washington. I think. <laughs> was he working for um, at the time? At that time, he was working for Rockefeller, the governor, uh, Governor Rockefeller. That coffee company was chock full of nuts. I don't. Th I think he was out of that by that time. Yeah, he was for chock full of nuts for quite a while. Did you also interview with with, with Rachel as well? No, 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 I never met her. possible just to get a brief synopsis of your writing career? Well, I, I, um, after, after World War II, I went to college, graduated from a little college down in East Orange, New Jersey, which is now out of business. I don't associate that to my, with my <laughs> career there. I played basketball and baseball there, and then I went into the newspaper business, and I was on little papers in Suffern, New York, Titusville, PA, Elyria, Ohio, and New York City. My New York City paper folded, as I said, in 1966, and I've been writing ever since as a freelance. I, I do a lot of work, for example, for Boys Life magazine and Scouting magazine, the Boy, Boy Scouts magazine. And then I do other stuff, too. I've written a little bit for Sports Illustrated and Sport and Seventeen Girls magazine and the New York Times magazine. And, and then I've written, I, the baseball book was my first book, and then in 84, 84, I wrote a book called Cages to Jump Shots, which was about the early days of professional basketball. And then in 90, no, 84 was a Boy Scout history, the 75th anniversary history of the Boy Scouts. In 90, I wrote this basketball book. In 96, I wrote a book called Pigskin, which is the early days of pro football. And since then, I've been coasting. <laughs> Is there a favorite? You've heard about baseball? Oh, baseball by far. I, I think it's a much more interesting game than the other two, personally. And you wrote on those other two subjects, you think there just was little, little or no literature on that? Oh, there wasn't. I, I, uh, I wrote much more about the early days of both sports than has ever been done before. Most guys who write histories of those sports kiss off the first 20 years in two pages. Mm -hmm. And I found out, for example, how do you ever hear of a cage, a basketball cage? Basketball players used to be called cagers. Mm -hmm. And the reason was that they played in a literal cage in the early days of professional basketball. It was a chicken wire enclosure on the court. And the idea was that the ball would not go out of bounds so they wouldn't be jumping in the laps of the spectators. And uh, so that kind of thing had never been really, uh, uh, reported before. So. That's the kind of thing I enjoy. Yeah. I like to be able to say, yeah, yeah, you didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? Is there something that you find? Uh, oh, I don't know. I'm, I, there's a, one of my old football players wants me to do a book for him, and I'm looking at the possibilities now. He's a r very good rock on tour, tells very funny stories, and I might be able to put something together for him, but I'm finished on sports books, I think. I, I don't think I'll do any more of those. Was, was there, were there, uh, since you met so many interesting people, aside from this rock and tour, uh, really would like to do a biography on or wish you had done a biography on? Well, I wanted to do a biography on Buck Leonard. I, I talked to him about, oh, it was probably around 1980, and he said he didn't, he didn't want a book, he didn't ever want a book written. Well, one was written about him, uh, his autobiography came out about a year ago, so I guess he changed his mind. And then he died, so. <laughs> I went home for that grade, $85 a month, my first season. 
The most I ever made in a colored baseball was $1,000 a month. Of course, now when you went to the foreign country, when well, you make a little more than you made over here. I played ball in Cuba for about four years and played in Mexico for about four or five years. We got more money for playing than we did over here in the in, in, uh, United States. That treated better over, over there. See. Now, in 1937, 1937, that was about the greatest team I ever been on with the Homestead Blades. That's where we had got Josh. And then for, for, for nine years, from 1937, to 1946, we had the real I do believe in all sincerity. Uh, the pirates couldn't have played us in those days. They wouldn't have stood a chance because we had, we had about five or six fellas that were uh, home run hitters. That Josh Gibson would tear anybody's ball, ball apart. Uh, Buck Leonard was the same thing. Uh, There's Victor Harris. And uh, they were just absolutely good ball players and hard hitters. A slick fielding first baseman who could hit for both power and a high average, Buck Leonard was a 12-time Negro League All-Star. They called Buck the Black Lou Gehrig. I wasn't a Gehrig. I saw Gary play. I saw him three or four times. I went to Yankees, they went to Washington to see him play twice, and went to New York to see him play three times. And uh, I wouldn't know Gary though. I could hit the ball like Gary. I could hit a long walk on it even now and then. Gary was a big man, bigger man than I was. And he could hit a ball further than I could. The Grays and other black teams barnstormed their way across the country, living on buses, playing two or three games a day. Baseball was something that I could do, and I loved it. I enjoyed all the years that I played. And I uh, had a lot of fun, <laughs> but it was a little work in it too. Because we were not playing night baseball, going around the lead after this ball game, going to another town to play in the next board next night, and going to the next to play in a different town every day. Play in a different town every day. Well, I suppose that's correct, but uh, I don't know. I, I, you would be hard pressed to find a, a book other than mine on the early days of professional basketball, and yet you can find whole series on the early days of baseball. You know, there's three volume series by uh, Harold Seymour, and three volumes by David Voigt, and scattered individual histories of the early days of baseball. That's easy to find. What's hard to find is some of the other sports, including hockey, but I don't like hockey, so I'm not going to do it. <laughs> other than the physical beating that they take in football and basketball, do you think that they could stand the test of playing every day? Do you think a fan would buy a note like they do baseball? That's a good question. I've never thought of asking that. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe not. As I said, I don't think those games are as interesting as baseball. You can sustain interest if you, if you enjoy baseball. You can sustain interest over 150 or odd games. Uh, you can't do that, I don't think, in football and basketball. In basketball, there's only one way to score. <laughs> you can't hit and run in, uh, in basketball. That's true. When you, when you wrote your football book, did you ever get into uh, a little bit of the semi-pros and your, your war in the red jackets? Oh, yeah. The war in red jackets in uh, 1938 played the Pittsburgh. They were pirates then. They became the Steelers two years later. And uh, they had um, Byron White, Wizard White, who played in Warren. And so uh, in, my, in my introduction to the football book, I t tell about that game how the Pirates came to uh, Warren on a bus and dressed at the Moose Club and came to the field, which had no field house. Warren Russell Field that I mentioned had no field house or any, any accommodation 
So at halftime, they sat around on the ground, just like the Warren Red Jackets did. That was the level of pro football in the late 30s. Uh, that was about what it was like in those days. So when you went to games like this, like for the, I'm, I'm uh, enjoying the history of baseball. And was there a sense of awe, though, when you were watching Josh Gibson or you were watching Wizard White? Was there, a, was there sort of something extraordinary there? Well, I was too young for that, I think. In 1938, when I saw Wizard White, I would have been 13. I don't think you're competent to make very clear distinctions about go I, I guess I was aware that, after all, he r rushed for 158 yards or something like that. So I, obviously I thought he must have been pretty good. But I certainly was no connoisseur of uh, sports skill. And the same thing applies to, uh, to uh, uh, Josh Gibson. I didn't know that he was one of the great hitters of all time. I, nothing to nothing to uh, compare him to. Born to watch James, and what you may remember. Well, number one, I couldn't get up here very often. We, my family didn't have a car. My father died during the Depression, so we didn't have a car. So I was dependent on, on the, uh, relatives bringing me up. But I had an uncle here who was a fan of the, of the Falcons at that time. Must have been in the early 40s. When, do, when were the Falcons here? Was it 40s? 41 was when they first started. Uh, all right, it was probably 41 or 42. I had an uncle here who took me to several ball games whenever I could get up. He liked baseball, and of course I did too. And uh, and that, and I remember it fairly well. I remember um, John Newman. I remember uh, uh, Al uh, Fedora, Fedorov, uh, Scooter Kashorik, and wasn't Earl Rapp the old outfielder here one or two years? Okay, so I I span the period from probably 41 through about 48 when basically I left the area and I didn't come back. But those were players that I remember in those years. And Jamestown, as I remember, had pretty good teams in those years. Yeah. What were the crowds? you remember? There were, there were the big numbers when you walked into a stadium? Was this a, any recollection of that? Well, they, they weren't hurting all badly, I don't think. Now, on the other hand, they weren't doing as well as the Sussex Cardinals do or <laughs> the Hudson Valley Renegades. They sell out. No, no. 4,800 <laughs> stadiums with 4,800 seats, and they sell them out. Very much aware we're in a small minor league market. <laughs> well, the Sussex Cardinals are out in the middle of a cow pasture, but they are they have enough population within an hour that they can do very well indeed. It's, well, uh, at that time you were coming to Jamestown, it was probably the finest minor league ballpark in the country. It was a very good what park, I remember that. What was your feeling walking in there as a youngster? Well, I was impressed. I, I probably not as impressed as some people, though, because I had another uncle out in Mount Vernon, New York. And when I visited him, I could see the Giants and the, and the Yankees. Yes. <laughs> uh, he he was a preacher and got free tickets to the Yankees and and, uh, and the Giants. So I saw Major League Baseball before I ever saw Minor League Baseball. But I was impressed. They had a beautiful stadium. At that time, I think it was called College Stadium, wasn't it? Uh, municipal stadium. Was it municipal? Then it became college. <coughs> All right. I thought it was college. Okay. Now Russell. Now Russell Teacher Stadium. Yeah, so I understand. That's very impressive. I've asked a lot of questions. And is there a question I should have asked you that I didn't? I have no idea. I just <laughs> I just ramble on and on. You've got to shut me up. The crowds, me. That, the crowds that came to the ballpark, were they predominantly white or were they... Uh, uh, my recollection is entirely white, but I don't know. What what would have been the black population of Jamestown in those days? Would you have had 5%? 700, 700, 700, 700 out of 35 or so? 40, no, it was, 45. was it that big then? Okay. Well, I remember playing ball against uh, black kids up here, basketball, but I, I, don't, I don't have any recollection of black people at the ballpark. I got to tell you, this has been utterly terrific, Bob. And well, for all of us, let me say thank you very much for taking my pleasure. Time out of your schedule. I, I don't have. It. Thank you. You guys have to go back to work. I don't. <laughs>